The next thing to think about with the critical approach to popular culture is the impact of corporate conglomeration. So, as he says here, while the total output of the media, culture, and entertainment industries, movies, books, music, television shows, DVDs, comics, video games, seems infinite, it represents the effort of only a small handful of highly profitable multinational corporations. And this gets worse and worse every year. I couldn't possibly keep up with this. Um, so here is a snapshot of what he's talking about. At the time of writing, there were three major record labels, six film studios, and five book publishers. Um, he goes on to describe some of the largest conglomerates. Those are Sony, Time Warner, Walt Disney, Viacom, CBS, Comcast, 21st Century Fox. And they're always conglomerating even more and more. So if you look at this, um, you have who owns the big TV networks, and you got your kind of big three here, what used to be CBS, ABC, and NBC. Right, those are the three network stations. But of course, Disney purchased ABC, so Disney's the parent company. Uh, Disney also owns, here it's only listed kind of through an arrow, but Disney owns ESPN. And all of these things come together. So Disney also now has Hulu, where Hulu used to be a grouping of many different networks. They created this website uh, where you could stream various television shows. Um, but by and large, Hulu is owned by Disney. Um, and you can always see this in your streaming apps, right? Because there's that kind of cross-pollination. Now, when I turn my son's Disney Plus profile on, I see all these like ABC shows popping up and I'm like, I don't know if that's appropriate, you know? Um, not that he clicks on them and, and streams them, but I'm also like, so last night, I, I don't know if anybody in here has watched the new show High Potential. It's a good show. You, 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 you're immediately in on it. Um, High Potential, I was watching it last night, but when I turn on Disney Plus, it's an ABC show. And I guess it's ranked low enough for kids to watch it, but my son would be bored to crap watching High Potential. Um, but it shows up on his Disney Plus account. Um, CBS, Viacom are all together. Viacom being MTV, BET, Nickelodeon, uh, country music, television. Um, all these things are owned by one company. Uh, so you can see the examples there. But there's also the inch issue of radio. And here he says, quote, they control billions of dollars of assets, hundreds of thousands of jobs, and untold political influence in Washington, particularly with regard to media policy. And that media policy that he's discussing um, so here's the, the ad for uh, or for what iHeartMedia, how it ranks. But then you get into this, the Telecommunications Act of 1996. It eliminated caps on how many broadcasters one company can own. And at the time I made this slide, it's constantly changing. I am positive that these numbers are not the same iHeartMedia, which used to be iHeartRadio. Does anybody know what it was before iHeartRadio? It was called Clear Channel. It owns 858 broadcast radio stations in the, in the United States of America. The next one is 
Cumulus Media, which owns 454 radio stations. You also have Sinclair Broadcast Group, which is an, has an ideological bend to it. It is a conservative media organization. They own 172 local TV stations. And what they were doing on Sinclair Broadcast Group is they were having similar stories produced in different markets that were coming from the corporate center. And these, again, have a political partisan bent to them. Um, you've got the Gar Gannett Company, which has 80 newspapers including the largest newspaper in the United States, USA Today. And the problem here is, while, yes, there might be 858 different stations, they're all the same. So in every market in the United States, essentially, Clear Channel, I'm sorry, iHeartMedia owns several stations in the DFW area. I'm not positive what, which ones they own. Um, what's the hot radio station? Like it'll be called like hot 10 something point something. 106.1 KISS FM. I don't know if KISS FM is, but it might be. Um, but at any rate, they have these different stations in different markets and they're all produced at the same location. And what they'll do is they'll have, um, depending on which station it is, they'll have Taylor Swift or Drake or somebody come on and go, hey Dallas, thanks for listening to 10X point Y, right? And enjoy that hot weather. They just sit there in a booth and they do a dozen of them and it gets played in a dozen different markets so it makes it feel like the station is local but it's totally not because the programming is happening at the corporate headquarters uh, and so this is happening on all these different um, media platforms and it's a result of the telecommunications act of 1996 which quote unquote deregulated um, media ownership. And here's something I think I may have told you about. I, I was starting to do a, a project called Paywall. I'm not going to do it now. Um, but one of the interesting things is, all right, Gannett owns 80 newspapers, including USA Today. One of the results of um, news on the internet has been uh, more and more conglomeration among newspapers so that local newspapers are actually owned by one central news organization. Um, it ends up laying off journalists, then journalists become gig workers, right? They have these precarious jobs where they get paid to write a story in their local market. So you've got that going on, but actually what's happened on the internet is more and more people read fewer and fewer news papers, news sites. Um, and so the biggest has been in the United States has been New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, and Fox. Now, Many of you probably realize this, but New York Times and Washington Post are behind paywalls, right? So unless you have access and subscribe, you can't read those articles. Now CNN is adding a paywall. So the three most read neutral news organizations on the internet are now behind paywalls. And Fox News, which again is a um, conservative aligned news organization, is like the only one behind a, without a paywall now of the top organizations. 
this impacts the kind of content that you're exposed to. And part of this whole critical approach, and I cannot emphasize this uh, uh, enough, and it comes back to the encoding decoding, it does not matter the political persuasions of the individuals that are writing the stories. What really matters is who owns the stations, the radio stations, the television stations, the newspapers. Who owns it tells you a lot more about the content that's going to come out than anything else. So we have this hyper conglomeration going. And what Grazian says is what we can really see going on with the critical approach um, is the reproduction of social inequality through popular culture. Um, so number one, you have the increase of profits of large corporations. And he says on page 59, quote, as our everyday purchases bolster their economic power to even greater heights, these corporations simultaneously widen the gulf between these enormous companies and their would-be competitors. So if you're trying to start a media organization, it's damn near impossible to compete with these large behemoths. But not only that, if you remember back to my discussion about um, class in America, labor creates all value. Labor creates all wealth. Remember, that's going to be a test question. What creates wealth? What creates value? Labor. Um, so capitalism works specifically by underpaying workers for their labor. That is where profit is created. And the thing that I want to, the reason why I keep bringing that up, is that is part of the ideological content that you consume. It's already there. When you're watching a TV show, the basic idea is that the TV show has to be profitable. That is ideology coming through. And remember, ideology is an upside-down picture of reality. So, what happens when we watch, when we consume popular culture, when we enjoy popular culture, is we're also taking in that ideological level. And we're ignoring the exploitation of the workers who actually produce the content. And oftentimes, as what often happens in our society is we blame the victims, right? We say, oh, uh, these actors or these artists, they're um, doing X, Y, and Z, but it's really not them. They're just trying to get paid. And that's the ideological message that comes through. So the increase of profit for large organizations also comes down to the fashion industry. In the fashion industry, there are faster changing trends that require faster production. And I don't, how many clothing seasons are there at this point? Like eight? Somebody, some fashion fan? It's more than four. It's more than my two. I got my warm clothes and my cold clothes. I broke out a long sleeve shirt today, everybody. Fall kind of arrived. But it's going to be 88 again by next week. But hey, enjoy the weather today. The one day, the one day is cold. I forget my jacket. It happens. Yeah. It's um, special, though. It's not bad. But there's this increasing fast fashion. Has anybody heard that fa that uh, phrase? Basically, the clothes are made cheaper and cheaper, whether or not you pay less for them. Um, 
so that profit can be generated, workers can be exploited, and you have to keep buying the clothes earlier and earlier so you stay in fashion. What I love is by the time I'm like, man, I need a new winter jacket, I can't find a winter jacket anymore because they've already moved on to spring clothing. And you know, February hits and I'm like, man, my, I may have mentioned this already, I have a winter jacket from way back at this point. It's busted. You'll probably see me wear it in at some point. It's got holes that are stitched together. Um, the the uh, zipper doesn't come all the way up. I have to do the buttons. Um, I really need a new jacket. I know I need a new jacket. It's hard for me even today when it's a high in the 70s to be like, yeah, I, I need to get a new winter jacket. So I roll into the store. But that's what they're trying to do, right? They want you to buy your winter clothing in August so that when February comes, you're buying your April clothing. Um, and so what ends up happening is they, these fashion companies employ workers in the global south and poor countries who are forced to work long hours for low wages. And what happens is we have sweatshop labor that produces clothes for workers who cannot afford those clothes. So here we go. This was a great um, campaign that somebody put together online. You've got this woman who made this outfit for a dollar and this woman who bought it for a hundred dollars. That shows the extreme inequity and exploitation that happens here. There's a great DVD uh, documentary called China Blue. Um, it's getting old at this point and, and China is rapidly changing so I don't necessarily know how accurate it is. But this, the content of it is going on somewhere. And what basically happens here is these girls who are like 13, 14 years old, go to live at this factory. They're exploited. They're not paid. They are a step above slave labor. And you see it and you recognize, oh, I'm rocking some blue jeans. And that's the labor that goes into it. There's also no out. There's no... Um, like, oh, I'm going to go find these clothes that are not uh, sweatshop labor. It's very hard to find. There's like American apparel in the United States. The problem with American apparel is it's number one, sexually exploitative, but number two, anti-union. So even though American apparel is being made in the United States of America, they don't want to treat the workers well. And so this in and of itself is its own inequity that goes on. So it's, you know, a big question. How do you find clothes that aren't made with um, blood, sweat, and tears? We also have fast food. In the fast food industry, uh, what, ends up, you, what you end up seeing is the hiring of young and docile workers for low pay. The skill is always low and always going down. And this is because of the automatizing and de-skilling of cooking food that drives the wages down. To work at McDonald's, you don't actually have to know how to cook. You put it in a little microwave thing and hit go. You throw the fries in the fryer, and when the timer goes off, you take them out. You don't actually know how to cook at that point, right? And increasingly, you don't even work a register because they have the automated kiosk where you do your ordering, right? And I love this little pin here. Skilled labor isn't cheap. Cheap labor isn't skilled. That's the kind of dialectic of skill. And media outlets increasingly rely on unpaid interns as a surplus pool of free labor. Now this is a problem on a number of levels. 
interns are des desperate for experience, right? And interns hope it will turn into a real job opportunity. But there's several other things going on here. And I mean, there's a great book, Intern Nation. Um, a movie that makes fun of it is The Internship. Uh, I love this um, little cartoon. I agreed I wouldn't bring my work home anymore. I didn't say anything about interns as he's using his intern as a uh, footrest, right? Um, and so what internships do, especially unpaid internships, is they sell the hope that you're going to get a job there with no guarantee. They sell the hope that you're getting experience for no pay. But what do interns end up doing? They don't end up doing the job they're hoping to do. They end up getting people coffee and making copies not actual jobs that they're hoping to learn to get skills for. Now they might absorb some things, but there's also a trick here. If a company has interns, they're also outsourcing labor to those interns unpaid that they would otherwise have to pay somebody to do the job at their office. So it actually makes other people unemployed, which creates a surplus labor, which lowers everybody's wages. It's a very screwed up process um, that we need to, to be aware of. And I know many of you are looking for internships I know you can get credit for internships in many of our programs at the university. We don't necessarily have rules about whether they're paid or unpaid. Um, I can tell you that most faculty would prefer that you had paid internships and not unpaid internships. But there's also, in many industries, a need to have an internship to be able to get a job. And if there aren't any paid internships available, what do you have to do? unpaid internship. What we need to have is we need to have government regulation that says a job is a job and if you're doing work there can't be a loophole that says you don't get paid. I don't know if this is a stupid question or not but I guess I'm just trying to get like an idea. If we know that these things are so exploitative and so bad and just terrible for people, why do they continue to exist? Because we don't stand up and fight against them. How do we do that physically? I don't know. That's beyond the scope of this class. Okay. But what we're looking at is an industry that gets free labor and then that makes them even that much more profitable. The next thing he discusses here is gender discrimination. And he says, quote, the media industries have also been accused of exasper exacerbating the social inequality often experienced by women in the workplace. Um, and this happens in a lot of different ways. But the number one problem has been that there are few top managers who are women. And that has kept women out of being in top places. Um, and this is especially true in media industries. So what's also happened is now we've had the pushback with hashtag me too in film and hashtag times up in music. Um, and these have to do with sexual harassment. Uh, and so if you look at these, right, I've got Harvey Weinstein and his hashtag me too. Everybody's heard of that. The next point he goes on to is about Hollywood stereotypes. Um, and so a, a stereotype, the kind of definition of a stereotype, is, where it came from is the actual thing that was what was called a, a physical stereotype, which is a relief 
printing plate cast in a mold made from composed type or an original plate. That's how they made newspapers and magazines and books before they had um, like active computerized printers. That's when, you know, people had to, in the printing press, they had to set the letters and then they stamped it. They put it on ink and then they stamp, ink, stamp, ink, stamp. That's what a stereotype is. More specifically, the way we use the phrase now is a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. And sociologically, we all stereotype. We do it unconsciously. It's part of how the human brain takes in new information. But the question then becomes, where do our stereotypes come from? And are we able to look past them? And what you see in Hollywood is the perpetuation of negative stereotypes. Sometimes stereotypes can be positive. Sometimes they can be fitting. Um, but when they're put out there on in Hollywood, it's often these negative, reductive types of stereotypes where we see um, male villains as ethnic caricatures, right? Like this guy down here. Um, people often in black, red, and brown face. This is a white guy made to look like he's Native American. And notice how stereotypical this portrayal of a Native American is. Um, female villains often are portrayed as unstable, which is a, a gender discriminatory stereotype towards women. Um, African Americans, uh, there are few black actors that have ever been nominated for Oscars, and even fewer have won. Um, those nominated and those who win tend to play the roles of homeless, violent, or criminal characters. So even when the film industry honors black actors, it's for stereotypical roles. So a few years ago, there was a hashtag started Oscars so white, because in that year, there had been no black actors that won um, an Academy Award. You also get into typecasting. And here, they actually, Grazian talks about um, Aziz Ansari. You may have picked that up. Aziz Ansari makes a very similar statement uh, to what the whole issue in the Master of None episode that we read, Indians on TV, where he says, I can never just be an everyday dude. Aziz Ansari says, I always have to be Indian first. And that's why he always, he was complaining about being a cab driver or being a uh, convenience store clerk or in the most positive view, being a scientist. All these are stereotypes and that demand that he do a voice, an Indian accent. So Grazian says that, quote, these pop cultural conventions lead to typecasting in the television and film industries that prevents female and minority actors from finding substantive roles. Um, so again, Aziz Ansari makes the critique that only white straight men get to be the everyman. And here you have John Leguizamo say, I had to do my own projects. It was an antidote to the system, to the Hollywoodness of it all. Because I didn't want to be a drug dealer or a murderer for the rest of my life. That's not me. That's not my people. Right? So in this, he's saying, the typecast isn't just bad if I go do it. But when you see the stereotypes 
on television or in film, it perpetuates negative stereotypes in society. So he's not just concerned about himself, he's concerned about his community, right? And so he described the way he had to go about making his own films to present positive images of Latinos. We can also think of popular culture as um, social control. And he asks this question here. How many readers would admit that they are easily manipulated by television commercials or magazine advertisements? Probably everybody in here, we already watched um, Gene Kilmore's Killing Us Softly. Nobody thinks that they um, are impacted by advertisement. But they wouldn't spend so much on advertising if it didn't work. And that might not, it might not always be simple. Maybe you're watching a football game and a pizza ad comes on and it's a Pizza Hut commercial. Well, you don't like Pizza Hut, but now what are you thinking about? You're thinking about pizza. And whatever is in your head about the pizza that you like, that's who you're going to call. Right? So you might not want Pizza Hut. Maybe you want Domino's. Maybe you want uh, Papa John's. Maybe you want your local pizzeria. But pizza's in your head. Now you want pizza. The same goes with all objects. But then it's also the case that the messages get through. And advertisers get the message across to the consumers that they want. And those consumers go and buy things. Because again, if advertising didn't work, you wouldn't spend the money on it. And on the flip side of that, talk to anybody that's ever produced a product without a very good marketing project, it doesn't get purchased. Marketing, advertising is incredibly important for products to get to market. And what all this does is it creates common sense. Um, and here's what the definition from Grazian is. He says, Culture, cultural hegemony operates at the level of common sense. It is a soft power that quietly engineers consensus around a set of myths that we have come to take for granted. And that's on page 65, that quote. But I often hear people say, oh, well, that person has common sense. They have street smarts, not book smarts. Things of that nature, right? Well, this concept here actually comes from Antonio Gramsci, who we talked about last class. And the idea of common sense is different from good sense. Common sense is that which we hold in common. And oftentimes, we hold very bad ideas in common because we're not very bright. So what we want to look for is good sense. And what ends up getting perpetuated in popular culture most often is common sense. This is one of my favorites. I often write about this quote, but the idea of planned obsolescence. Grazian mentions fashion. Last, he says, a quote, last season's fashions are so last season. But with pretty much everything, new products come on the scene that make old products obsolete. On the one hand, you get repeated consumption, things like medicine, um, which I'll come back to over here in a second with, Rick, with Chris Rock. Uh, you get new models that replace old models. Yeah, your car might be fine, but you want that new ride, right? You want the new clothes to replace your old clothes so that you look in today's fashion. But also repairs. So the quote here, um, and, and this is a great comedy album. I'm not usually into comedy albums, but Chris Rock, 
right around 2000, came out with this album. It's called Bigger and Blacker. And this is one of the quotes. He says, ain't no money in the cure. The money's in the medicine. They ain't curing shit. They will find a way for you to live with it. That's how a drug dealer gets paid on the comeback. He goes on in this bit to talk about AIDS. And he says... The goal isn't to cure AIDS. The goal is to make it so you can live with it. At the time he was writing, AIDS was a death sentence. And he was totally right. So basically he says, the goal is that one day, uh, Johnny didn't come to work yesterday. He comes in today and you ask him, Oh, what was wrong? Were you sick? And he was like, yeah, my AIDS was acting up again. Right? And that's the punchline because it's like they want you to live with it so you stay on the drugs for your whole life. The money's not in the cure. That's planned obsolescence. And then he goes bigger. This is my favorite. They can, they can but they won't. Just like a Cadillac dealer. They got metal on the space shuttle that can withstand 20,000 degrees. You mean to tell me they can't make an Eldorado where the fucking bumper don't fall off? They can, but they won't. The money is in fixing your Eldorado and eventually having to buy a new Eldorado, right? There's no money if you don't ever have to buy the thing again or repair it. There's a complete industry of automotive or automotive repair so that when your car breaks down, you go fix it. And in popular culture, this is also seductive. When they first produced, hold on, let me look at my next slide. Um, when they first started producing gramophones, they didn't know what would sell on a gramophone. As I told you, they thought, oh, well, maybe they'll listen to dead people's voices the same way that a photograph keeps dead people's images around, right? So they thought that was going to be used until they found, oh, man, people want to listen to music on a gramophone. So let's produce music for it and sell that. Then they figured out that the money was in producing music not the machine. Because in every household, how many gramophones are you going to own? One? Maybe two? But once every household has a gramophone, and they used to make things better, there was less planned obsolescence in the machine, um, you don't need another gramophone. So what they really wanted you to do was to buy music for it. And you see that again and again with popular culture. Whether that's now our streaming subscriptions or with video games, always having to buy the latest video games with the latest graphics, watching new television shows, not old television shows, new movies, not old movies. It's a constant effort at planned obsolescence to drive more consumption. <clears throat> There's also this idea that shopping completes us. We feel an emptiness. And when we buy things, we feel relief. It makes us whole. And Herbert Marcuse discusses this as, quote unquote, one-dimensional man. It's a great book. I told you Herbert Marcuse was one of the Frankfurt School that came over. Came over. He was a lot more um, positive than Adorno and Horkheimer. He was embracing of the society around him. Um, he ended up being a leader of the new left in the 1960s that, left, that led to the hippie counterculture. Uh, but One Dimensional Man was basically this idea that he gets deep into psychoanalysis um, but this idea that there's more to us than consumption. 
There's our personal relationships that we have with people. There are um, our hopes and our dreams. But everything in contemporary society comes down to consumption. So even our interaction with other people is through objects too, by buying things for people, by our ability to buy things for other people, um, by seeing ourselves and our value by what we own and not by what we do or who we are, right? What we do for other people. It's all based on consumption. And by consuming popular culture, we also all want to live like celebrities. And as I think I've described to you all before, consumerism increasingly depends on borrowed credit. Up until um, the past couple of years where real wages actually increased, Wages have been stagnant since the 70s. But we're told we need to buy more and more things. Think about it. If we were in the 1970s, you wouldn't have a cell phone bill for each person in your household who also owns a cell phone. You didn't have internet to pay for. You didn't have all these computers, different um, uh, devices that we're constantly connected to. You didn't have all that. You didn't have streaming subscriptions. You didn't even have cable subscriptions, right? So there was less that we spent money on. Now we have to spend money that we don't have. So consumer debt is skyrocketing. And it shows no sign of slowing. And what do you all think is the biggest moment uh, that people go into consumer debt? What was that? Credit cards. Well, credit cards, but when do people really rely the most on their credit cards? Like college age. College age. What time of year? Christmas. Why winter? Christmas. So it feels like it would be Christmas, right? The fact is, it's not at Christmas time when most Americans go into debt. Most Americans go into debt at back to school. Because people actually plan for their Christmas purchases. They set themselves a budget. Some places, not universities, not governments, actually give end of the year bonuses. So if you're like, all right, I'm going to get a couple extra hundred dollars as a bonus. I'm going to spend that on my Christmas shopping, right? That's not what happens, though, at back to school. What happens at back to school is people want their kids to look fresh. You don't want to send your school, your kid to school and beat up old clothes that don't fit, right? So you go back to school shopping. Schools mandate that you buy certain supplies, so you're going to be spending on that. You're going to be buying new book bags. This I've had this book bag for, I think, since 2007. It's still going strong. It's a great one. I, I should be a walking advertisement for Targus. Targus, if you're watching, send me some money. <laughs> well, this one's starting to break. <laughs> it's great though. You, but usually, you know, your Jam Sport or something's gonna break down. Um, but you get your kid back to back to school and you start buying these things, and then you go into J.C. Penney or Macy's or something, and you get in the line and you got all these clothes. And what do they offer you at the counter? Yeah, same. Oh, man. Not a membership. A credit, a credit card. Then they might offer you a discount. Like, oh, you got a lot of clothes. Do you want a credit card? We'll give you 20% off just for signing up for the credit card. And you go, oh, cool. Hey, why don't you grab those boxers over there while you're at it? Or like, oh, we can get some more clothes. 
and you put it on that credit card and people don't even think about it and that's where the the debt balloons so that is actually the biggest moment of consumer debt increases is back to school shopping we also take our self-worth here our self-worth is determined by our looks and cultural norms of sexual attractiveness now remember we talked about this in killing us softly for advertising defines our sexual desirability and how we think of ourselves and our potential partners as potentially sexually desirable and so what this ends up is it results in eating disorders unattainable expectations elective plastic surgery all of these things that have major impacts on the self and psyche we don't even realize that we do but the the things the images that we see in popular culture make us want to be and want others to be a particular way that has nothing to do with who we are and what we hope we would value right it gets all confused and that's how we end up measuring our self-worth Grazian talks about the Diamonds Are Forever campaign. And basically, we all know if you want to get engaged, what are you supposed to get a woman? Uh, what kind of ring? A diamond ring. It's got to be. Women are expected to have diamond engagement rings. My wife has one. Didn't get it till the 10th anniversary. My wife actually proposed to me. And we had <laughs> wedding bands. And I was like, all right, your 10th anniversary, you can have a diamond engagement ring. And so she's got it, but this this whole idea of having a diamond engagement ring is a very contemporary western idea that's permeated the whole world over and it's because of de beers de beers is a diamond cartel they're not even allowed to operate supposedly in the united states of america they're banned from the united states of america but they own all the diamond production in the world they own the diamond mines they own the patents for um uh man-made diamonds so if you want a diamond it essentially goes to de beers and so before they had this campaign of diamonds are forever which became a um james bond film and the theme song for it that then kanye redid diamonds forever or diamonds are forever um this was all an ad campaign created by De Beers that's also how we know advertising works and brands matter brands Grazian says, quote, brands connote status. And one of the things he brings up is, think of brand power of fragrances. Who cares what a fragrance is? But Rihanna came up with Riru. Or somebody did. And I don't know about you, I have no idea what Rihanna smells like. Has anybody in here smelled Rihanna? I can imagine she smells nice. But 
why is there like this brand recognition of her having a fragrance? We don't even know if she wears it. That's the other part of this. She might think that the fragrance she produces smells awful. But most of us will never come close enough to Rihanna to be like, oh yeah, that smells good. That's the way I want to smell. For all we know, she uses other products on herself and markets this, right? And I'm not just picking on Rihanna here. It just, it's one of those things that strikes me. Oh, get re um, But Starbucks, right? At the end of the day, Starbucks flavored coffees are like crack. They're wonderful, right? But star I just drink black coffee. Starbucks black coffee is disgusting. It is really bitter. It's not good coffee. But people spend so much money a year on Starbucks for a connection to Starbucks because of the branding. Now increasingly because of the convenience because you can have an app and order your coffee before you even get there so that it's waiting for you, right? But you'll find a lot better coffee at your local coffee shops than you will at Starbucks. But that's not even a, con a consideration here. It's all about the branding. Apple, many of you, well, I'm seeing quite a, f I'm seeing fewer Apple products in here than I, I usually do. Um, oh, you, you're putting it down, so I don't. I I wouldn't have even noticed it if you didn't move it because of the reflection from your um, case. People have an affinity with brands, and that's what they buy, right? And so Apple, um, people swear by them, but they're actually overpriced computers. Uh, as you took a picture with your Apple <laughs> iPad, it's great. Um, so we, we, we connect with all these brands, and it's especially impactful on kids. Children develop, start de developing brand affinities when they're like infants. And they will stick with brands their entire life. So these companies know that they need to get in there and they need to get in there early to hook their customers. So it moves beyond any desire for any given thing because of the quality of a product, but rather just what you have that brand affinity for. So he concludes the section with when popular culture attacks. And he says, according to the critical approach, the primary motivation for designing and programming media and popular culture is money, not creativity, not free expression, not pleasure, and certainly not fun, but the unabashed pursuit of profit. So we end up with new popular culture goods, no matter how much we love them. We end up with them because some company is trying to cash in our, on our desires that can never be met. That's it for today.